Very good. Very nice to be with you all and appreciate the opportunity to open the word of God together. Now we're going to be reading primarily in John chapter 15. But before we go there, I'm going to read to you from Psalm number 80. Just a few verses in Psalm number 80 before we look at John 15. So Psalm number 80 and beginning at verse number 8. Psalm 80 and verse number 8, a Psalm of Asaph. And the psalmist says, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it, thou preparest room before it, that's caused it to take deep root and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent out her boughs unto the sea, her branches unto the river. Now we'll go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and we'll just look at the final sentence of the previous chapter, chapter 14, just as part of the background. Lord Jesus Christ saying, arise and let us go hence. So they've been in the upper room, and the Lord Jesus Christ now says, arise and let us go hence. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, you are clean to the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot... Okay, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that it abide in the vine. No more can you, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Then gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be, or so shall you become. My disciples, as the Father hath loved me, even so loved I you, continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be filled full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this. A man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now that's all we'll read for now, because the subject is vast, and we will not be able to cover the entire chapter, or even the entire subject. But nevertheless, I think there's so much... That is very, very profitable here for us to consider. It is interesting that there are many chapters or at least several chapters that come to mind immediately in our Bible that are frequently subjects for ministry and in and of themselves, they are very profitable. But when the context is appreciated, their value is multiplied. One of those chapters is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, often quoted or read at weddings. Other occasions, but when seen in the context of the entire epistle and the relationship of believers with each other in that assembly, we appreciate something more and something richer from that chapter. Another chapter is, is Romans chapter 8 that is frequently ministered on and seen in the broad context of the epistle is very, very rich in its unfolding of truth to us. John 15 is another similar chapter, and it is one that we can look at it in contrast with Israel as the vine. We appreciate why the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of himself as the true vine. Israel was the vine, and according to Isaiah chapter 5, they brought forth wild grapes, sour grapes. There, there was nothing there for God. There are multiple places in the Old Testament where Israel is spoken of as being a vine. Many times in Jeremiah and elsewhere, the, the 
picture of a vine is presented. But then also not only the contrast, but something as well of the of the context in which it's found. The Lord Jesus Christ was in the upper room in chapter 13 and chapter 14, and he was speaking of his absence and of his ministry for them in his absence. But now in chapter 15, very possibly they have left the upper room. They have walked down the Hedron Valley and passed by the vineyards that were there. They possibly also passed by the Temple of Herod. And Josephus and Christian historians tell us that all the doors of Herod's temple were large pictures of vines that had been etched into the door. And it may well be that he was referring to those as well. So there was a context as well as he moves through the Kidron Valley and he has an object lesson before him for the disciples to appreciate. But as well, the Lord Jesus has mentioned his going away. And we can begin to appreciate something of disciples who are so dependent on the Lord Jesus during those years. Suddenly, every prop is going to be removed. How will they cope? How will they manage? How will they continue to be disciples of the Lord Jesus in his absence? And chapter 15 will bring us then to how the Lord Jesus Christ will relate to his disciples in the time of his absence. If we were dividing the chapter, it divides very nicely. The first 11 verses, we are seen as fruit bearers. In verses 12 to 17, we are seen as friends. And as in verses 18 to 27, we are seen as being fellow witnesses. If you think of fruit bearers, it's dealing with my relationship with the Lord. When you think about friends, it's my relationship to my brothers and sisters. When you think about being a fellow witness, it's my relationship to society around me. Now we have mentioned or dealt with the Lord Jesus as the true light. We have seen him here tonight. We're looking at him as the true vine. And we saw him last week as the true bread. So there is revelation. There is relationship and refreshment, and now there is going to be reproduction of his life in each of our lives as we move here for God. This chapter contains the source of all fruit for God is found in the vine. We have the secret of fruit bearing. Our responsibility is abiding in the vine. We have the standard for all relationships to love as he has loved. And we have support for testimony bearing at the end of the chapter, the spirit of truth coming to enable us to bear witness to truth. So I want to just look then, especially at these first 11 verses, and notice something of fruit bearing and our relationship and our reflection to Christ. I'll just mention one very interesting thing for those who wish to follow up on this, are free to follow up on it. Each of these chapters referred to as the upper room ministry, although, as we mentioned, this may have actually been in on the way to Gethsemane. Each of these chapters have a word found more commonly in that chapter than any other chapter in the New Testament. Now, obviously, the word here in challenge chapter 15 is the word abide. As you go down the chapter, it's found at least 12 times more than any other chapter in the New Testament. Going back to chapter 13, the word that is found more in John 13 than any other chapter of the New Testament, is the word watch. So we are keyed in immediately to the theme of each chapter. Chapter 14, the most common word, occurs 17 times. It is the word father. Father. 17 times in John 14. John 15, we've mentioned abide. John 16, six times over, he says these things, these things. So he's pointing to very, very important truths. And then finally, John chapter 17, and it is somewhat of a, almost a seeming paradox that the word most commonly found in John 17, more than any other chapter in the New Testament, is the word world. It is the most unworldly 
prayer, and yet the word world is found in that chapter no less than 19 times more than any other chapter of our New Testament. And so the theme of each of these chapters can be coalesced around the word that is found most frequently in each of these chapters. And the Lord Jesus Christ links all of his thoughts with those particular words. So I want you just to think now with me of the Lord Jesus here speaking of himself as being the true vine. Relative to the entire Gospel of John, I think we mentioned either the first week or the second week, one of John's themes is the Lord Jesus Christ replacing everything in Israel. Chapter 1, he tabernacles amongst us. He replaces the tabernacle. Chapter 2, destroy this temple. He replaces the temple. Chapter 3, he replaces the teacher, Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel. The Lord Jesus shows himself superior to Nicodemus. He will replace all of the types and shadows, the manna, the water of life, and all of that. Here, he is replacing Israel as the vine. He is the true vine. The other thing that John 1 introduced at the very beginning in those words, without him was not one thing made that was made. John 1 introduces the indispensable Christ. Indispensable to creation. Indispensable to revelation. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, the bosom of the father. He's brought him out to be seen. He was indispensable to revelation. He is indispensable to salvation. And here we see as well, he is indispensable to fruit bearing on earth. What John 15 is saying is that the only fruit that God finds on planet earth is the life of Christ reproduced in believers. He is the source of all fruit for God, even now at this moment. He is in heaven, we are upon earth, but that light flowing through us is the only fruit that God finds for his pleasure here upon earth. It's interesting, if I were to take you to Galatians chapter five, and we looked at the fruit of the spirit, the first three things mentioned relative to the fruit of the spirit are love, joy, and peace. And then you go on to gentleness, goodness, and so on. But love, joy, and peace are the first three mentioned. In these very chapters we're looking at, in chapter number 14, the Lord Jesus Christ says, My peace I leave with you, I give unto you. Look of his peace. The chapter we have read tonight, chapter 15, in verse number 9, we read about my love. In verse number 11, we read about my joy. So in the very shadow of Calvary, he is speaking about his love, his peace, his joy. A life that was fruitful in every way. The fullness of the fruit the Spirit can produce in your life and mine was seen. And all of us plentitude in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in these chapters, he makes mention of those very three things. Love, joy, peace, in chapter 14 and in chapter 15. But I've been hinting at or at least suggesting, and let me just now draw your attention to it. The, the fruit, what is the product that the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking of here? When he speaks about fruit bearing. We instinctively think about seeing people saved thinking about people being brought into the assembly. We think of our service for God and link that with fruit. But a moment's reflection will help us to realize the life of the vine is being reproduced in the branches. So what we are looking at here is not what I do for God, what I do for the Lord Jesus. It's really what I am. It is my Christ-like character that is being formed as a result of abiding in Christ. It was a very godly man who said, the greatest hindrance to our Christ-likeness is our service for Christ. We become so busy, so preoccupied, that sometimes we fail to abide as we ought to. 
And as a result of not abiding, he failed to display and reflect something of the character of Christ that God intends to see in our lives. So we have the picture then. We have the, the product is the fruit that is Christ's likeness. And the picture given to us in verse number one, Christ as the vine. Here is God's provision for fruitfulness, even when the Lord Jesus Christ is absent. He is in heaven. We are upon earth. And yet there is this vital link. We are branches in the vine. And as such, we have the great potential for bearing fruit for God. And the Lord Jesus Christ says here, I am the, the true vine. Again, it's the idea of the genuine, the ultimate, everything God had in mind by all the pictures he gave in the Old Testament. Here is what God had in mind all along to reveal to men that true life and the display of that life was all the result of being linked with the Lord Jesus Christ as we are now as a result of the of the grace of God. Verse number two tells us about the, the purging. Every branch in me, the Lord Jesus Christ says, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, this will take a bit of explanation. And there likely will be some disagreement. This word that is used here for take away is frequently translated to lift up. And I would suggest to you the picture in this verse is every branch that has become earthbound. Every branch that has become mired into the earth and covered with dirt and covered with dust and is not bearing fruit. He cleanses it. He, he lifts it and he enables it now to be lifted out of the condition and where it was linked so closely with earth and now is able not to bear fruit. So there is the, the purging by the husbandman to lift and to clean. Not so much pruning that is in view, although that certainly is part of the vine, but it's more the idea of the ministry of our father to wean us away from earth. In a very real way, I think what we're going through right now in the sheltering in place during this pandemic, in many ways, has made us reassess a lot of things, things that are of value. It has had the effect in, for many of us of weaning us a bit, of, of lifting us a bit from our earthbound condition and making us realize how transient, how immaterial so much of what we grasp really is. And God has, the Father has been weaning us away, lifting us from our earthbound condition and enabling us, hopefully, to bear more fruit in the future. And so it reminds us here of the ministry, first of all, of the Father, that he lifts us and he enables us now to bear more fruit as he purges us. We are reminded of the power for fruit bearing. I know all of us as young Christians, we... Um, we thought that we had to do a certain things, that we had to correct certain habits. We had to change certain ways. And in a measure, there is a responsibility, but always have to come back to this. The power for a new life lies in the vine. We tap into that power by abiding in the vine, by enjoying fellowship with him. And so the life is in the vine. We are the branches and Christ's likeness is reproduced in us. And as you know, in this chapter, there is fruit. There is more fruit. There is much fruit. All of that is seen as a result of abiding in the vine. This fruit that we're looking at is not uh, a nice personality. It's not learning how to be diplomatic. It's not charisma. It's none of those things. What is produced is not natural. It's not, our, not something good about our nature coming through. Not a matter of extinguishing the demons and... Uh, Calling on the angels, as Ronald Reagan said, it is rather a matter of Christ's life being developed in me and his life being seen and being displayed in, in my life. You recall, those of you that like your Old Testament and like the offerings, recall that there was to, never to be honey or leaven in the meal offering. That, that perfect life displayed by Christ, no leaven, no honey. Leaven is the worst of nature. Honey is the best of nature, but neither was to be in the meal offering. Nothing of nature, all of Christ, 
is seen in our life. So we come then to the priority. And we've mentioned the priority that we are brought to then in verse number three and verse number four is our responsibility to abide in the vine. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, neither can you except ye abide in me. And so we come now to the key to all fruit bearing. And it can be asked very honestly, what does it mean to abide in Christ? Is this some super spiritual condition? Is this something known only to a few super elites among the people of God? Maybe only to full-time preachers or to missionaries. Well, this is really expected of every believer to abide in Christ. Later on, we'll read the Lord Jesus Christ says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. So we're given an insight there to what it means to abide in Christ. It means to enjoy fellowship with him through the word of God. We allow the word of God, the scriptures, to control our values. First Corinthians chapter 2 is a chapter where Paul is dealing with the problem, one of the problems at Corinth, that the people in Corinth had bought into the value system of Corinth around them. Their love for the spectacular, their emphasis upon rhetoric and logic and debating skills, their desire for prominence, all of the value system of Corinth and invaded the assembly. And in chapter two, he tells them that the apostles were communicating in their writing the mind of Christ. In other words, to think the way Christ thinks, to have his values control my life. It means as well that it will conform my life to him and it will change and control my behavior in the world. So abiding in Christ means the word of God abiding in me, and my abiding in the word. The concept of abiding in Christ is not something that requires a monastery or seclusion or some special experiences. It should be the day by day experience of each one of us to abide in Christ, to enjoy fellowship with him. And we come to the word of God to enjoy and to experience that fellowship. And so we are reminded here of abiding in Christ and of its, its importance relative to. Verse number six reminds us of a tremendous danger, a peril that we face. I would just suggest to you without going into a lot of detail and background that verse number six may well refer to Judas. No longer a branch, but if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth. Just as men would cast a dry branch away, he is as forth as a branch and is withered and men gather and men do the casting and men do the burning men do the judging suggest to you verse six could well be referring just to judas but i want to come especially to verses seven and eight and try to understand them in their context now if you just read verse seven and nothing else in this chapter you would think that is wonderful i mean we can we're abiding in christ we can ask what we want and it will be done for us of our father which is in heaven and that's a blank check i can ask anything i want and it's going to be done for me well a number of things i think to notice here number one is it he abide in me and my words abide in you and again if that's the case i'm going to control my values i'm going to control my vision and i'm going to want what christ wants i'm going to seek what christ is seeking so that's number one. That's the um, one of the boundaries that this verse has to protect us from thinking that anything goes relative to what this verse says. But I think there's even something more involved in what he says. Look at the next verse, verse number eight. Herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye become my disciples. So linking verse seven and verse eight together. The way God is glorified and the way we grow increasingly as disciples is by fruit bearing. Now, when you think of the whole principle of discipleship, there are a number of things that come to mind. 
Being a disciple means being led by a, a mentor, by a teacher. Being a disciple means learning from your mentor. That's what they did all these three years. They were learning at his feet as disciples. Certainly, being a disciple means having a love for the one you are following. But ultimately, the key about being a disciple that verse 8 brings before us is this. The goal of discipleship is likeness to the teacher. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. So now come back now to verses seven and eight, because these are very, very sober, searching verses that humble me and they will have some effect upon you. What I think the Lord Jesus Christ is saying is, as I read his word, as I enjoy fellowship with him, as that word abides in me, I become conscious, painfully conscious of how unlike him I am. And as I become conscious of how unlike him I am, I can come to the Father and I can ask that he will give me grace to become like his son. And then you can see how what follows immediately is here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you become like me. Here is how likeness to Christ develops. As I enjoy fellowship with him, as I have the word of God abide in me, I am aware of my deficiencies. I am aware of how far short I come of being Christ-like. My pride, my selfishness, my pettiness, so unlike him in every way. And I come to the Father confessing those things and asking him for grace become more like his son. Now, from that, there is a principle that needs to be emphasized. And I'm almost embarrassed to say it because I fail so, so dreadfully. But here's the principle that these verses teach me. That I can be as much like Christ as I wish to be. Christ's likeness is a goal that is open for me and as much as I want to go in for it, God will enable me to become like his son. So each one of us has that challenge. You can be as much like Christ as you wish to be. You may say, well, you don't know me. I've got a bad temper. I've got, uh, I just have some very bad habits. The Lord Jesus Christ says here, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will. And it will be done to you by my Father which is in heaven. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So we are reminded here then of this tremendous potential of becoming like Christ as a result of knowing fellowship with him. Verses 9 to 11, uh, I'm conscious of the time. Verses 9 to 11 bring before us the great provision for fruit bearing. And it is a, an abiding in Christ, recognizing that he supplies all the life, all the life giving ability to the branches. And we are reminded here that abiding in him means abiding in his love. Continue you or abide is the word in the original. Abide in my love. Consciousness and enjoyment of his love day by day and the wonder of his grace to us. You recall how Jude ends his epistle, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, keeping yourselves in the love of God. The idea being just being in the stream of God's love as it flows. Here again, the idea of abiding in his love and obedience to his word as a result of our love. And we see here, likewise, the end result of that is that your joy may be full. Just a word or two about that. His, his love, think of his love as the reservoir for your life and mine. And appreciating it and dwelling in it will result in the 
change in the character that God so desires to see in our lives. Just abiding in Christ and abiding in his love. And then, of course, we have as well linked with that further down the word of God in verse number 15. But I want you to think of what we have in verses 10 and 11. That obedience leads to joy. And I want to just draw your attention to this because this is counterculture to our society. First of all, our society, the ultimate goal of everyone, or at least of nine out of 10 people who did a survey, the goal of their life is happiness. Everyone wants to be happy. And the way you get happy is by doing what you want to, and you don't have to worry about obedience or recognizing any rules or anything. As long as you don't hurt anyone else, you can do as you please, and uh, that's, what, that's the road to happiness. First of all, the word of God makes very clear. Happiness or joy should never be a goal in my life. They are byproducts. They are the result of other things happening in my life. You recall the Lord Jesus in John 13, where you can read for yourself. He says, if ye know these things, happy are you if you do them. Or really the word is blessed. But still it's the idea, here's where you'll find true blessing, true happiness is in obeying the word of God. Here, likewise, the Lord Jesus makes clear, obedience will lead to joy. A life of joy, a life of the fruit of the spirit being seen in your life. Love, joy, peace, all of those things being displayed in your life and in mine. So we're reminded here in verses 9 to 11 that obedience will lead to joy. Rebellion never leads to joy. It, it may lead to temporary happiness. It leads to temporary satisfaction, but it leads to guilt, it leads to misery, and it eventually will lead to tremendous tragedy in a believer's life. And we all have rebellion in our hearts. Remember that every sin, every sin has at its root rebellion against God. However minor we may label it, however insignificant we may think it to be, every sin has at its root rebellion against the God of heaven. And so obedience is required and leads to joy in a believer's life. I'll just mention very quickly because I want to stop. I think it's five of. The Lord Jesus then comes to friends in the next few verses and relationships one with another. A new precept, a new pattern, a new proof of that love. There are over 31 another statements in the New Testament, most of them from the pen of the Apostle Paul. And I forget how many times love one another is among those 30 different statements. But exhorting one another, comforting one another, building up one another, edifying one another, provoking one another to love and good works. Go through the epistles. Time and again, Paul refers to one another. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ puts these branches in relationship to each other. We are friends, one with another, and we are called upon here to not only obey, but to love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this. Here's the, uh, here's the measure of that love, if you will, or the extent of it, that a man lay down his life for his friends were brought into the counsel of God. This is, of course, here in this chapter, a reminder of Abraham. Abraham, the friend of God. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I'm about to do? As a result of friendship, Abraham was brought into fellowship with God. As a result of being friends, we are brought into fellowship with Christ. His secrets are revealed to us, enable us to pray more intelligently, be able to abide in the vine. All of this holds together. And we're brought at the end of the chapter to the hostile environment in which fruit will be born. The Lord Jesus tells us that they hate me without a cause, or I hate you without a cause. So that's you are going to be facing a very, very hostile society. Society that does not value what you value. The fruit you are bearing, they may admire your life, but really they think it's a waste. You're going to be bearing fruit in a hostile environment. You will need help to do that. Help with the spirit of God. And so we are reminded here just of the necessity of abiding in Christ. The tremendous pleasure that is brought to God and glory that is brought to God, not by what I do, by what I am. 
character of a believer is more important than the capability of a believer. Godliness always trumps gifts. Remember that. God is looking for godliness, Christ likeness in believers. And so, if you come to the end of this chapter that we have touched on very, very quickly, we are reminded that there will be lots of opposition to fruit bearing, the sinful nature within, the hostile environment around us. And yet, we have a link with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the living Spirit of God within. We have the Word of God with us and a Father who will. Answer our prayer and enable us to be Christ like to the measure in which we desire to do so. So we trust God will bless His word, challenge us, as well as comfort us amidst all the circumstances that have come upon us to realize that we can bear fruit in any circumstance. God will never bring a circumstance into your life and mine which is intended to hinder fruit bearing. So even now, amidst this pandemic, we can bear fruit that will bring pleasure to God's heart, glory to his name. Thank you.